welcome to another investment podcast with Factail. We've got a very big episode today um, with a very prestigious name in Australian finance, uh, I guess. Uh, he's a specialist in commercial property and he has made himself and his investors lots of money for at least uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, his name is Warren Ebert or Herbert, and he is the chief executive officer um, of a company called Sentinel Group, which is an unlisted real estate investment trust. And I wanted to get him on because the ASX has seen one of the sharpest um, pullbacks in the real estate investment uh, sector in the last 20 years, excluding uh, the COVID collapse, which obviously uh, smashed um, well the entire market, but uh, REITs especially. Um, but going back further, it's unusual to see such a large drawdown in this sector. Uh, at one point, it was down uh, 30% uh, from its 2021 high. So that's interesting to me because the numbers they're coming out with are actually pretty good. The yields are good. They're revaluing their properties. So the tailwinds look pretty good. So what spooked everybody? Well, everyone's been spooked by the rising interest rates. So um, if you've got a property and you're only, for example, getting uh, you know a 2% uh, rent rise and inflation's going bananas and you're locked into a long lease, um, it starts to damage the outlook for that property. So, but will uh, those interest rates fears manifest into actually much, much higher rates that have spooked everybody? Well, we don't know. So as the moment, those fears are beginning to cool down a little bit. So the sector has begun to stabilise, to my observation, and I'm starting to think that there's a pretty good buying opportunity if you're looking for income and sort of slow, longer-term capital growth. But to get a perspective on the commercial property sector from both his point of view and his observations of what's happening on the market, we got Warren on. Uh, he produced a, a great article in what well, was sorry, I should say, it was quoted in, a, in an excellent article in the Australian Financial Review just the other week, warning that industrial property in his mind has been overbid and uh, the landlords there have locked themselves or some of the landlords have locked themselves into long leases that they will struggle to cope with the current inflationary environment. But what about some of the other sectors? There's all sorts of sectors on the REITs. There's shopping centres, uh, self-storage offices. Um, outside the share market, there's smaller uh, commercial properties. Think any sort of shop or uh, building, industrial building that uh, rents to somebody else, uh, are there opportunities there? And what are the dangers? So there's heaps to talk about uh, with this thing. And as I say, he runs a $2 billion fund. So he's a serious investor um, whose word carries a lot of weight in the market. And it's a privilege to have him on. So here he is, the Chief Executive Officer of Sentinel Group. So, as you know, I saw your article and, and researched Sentinel and everything that you've done. So, to put it in context, uh, the listed REIT sector on the ASX, which is what we normally follow here at Fatale, um, the share market, I mean by that, uh, is down very badly since its August 2021 highs. And I went back and looked at the last 20 years or so, and the only two worst periods were, um, which I'm sure you know, were COVID and 2008. Um, there were some smaller drawdowns with the volatility of the share market along the way, but it does seem quite extreme recently in the listed space. Mm -hmm. When I look at most of their results, though, they're, they're actually not going too bad. So do you think that the market investors in general are overreacting to the inflation and interest rate fears that are driving mm -hmm. this downturn? Callum, I don't think they've reacted hard enough. Yeah, I think what happened is it's, uh, like with most things, most things go too high and they come off too low. Yeah, a, a lot of the, the, the things were, were way overpriced uh, and they're starting to come back to reality. Now, now some of them I don't even think are down, down to reality. Uh, yeah, when, when there's, I don't know, there's lots and lots of them, so there'd, there'd be some who, who could have been hit too hard. But a lot of the sectors they got in were way, way overpriced and the multiples some of these companies uh, were on were, were you know, on the projection that the growth of the last few years was going to continue. So not only do they have to pull back to take that growth away, but they've got to pull back to, to take in, into account the, the, the reduction in, in NTA. Right. Okay. Um, and you obviously, I would presume that you are very reachable for your investor base. Um, 
as opposed to probably some other directors of companies and that type of thing. In terms of the feedback from the people you manage money for, are they worried about the overall macro environment? Are they stressed or are they happy to like acknowledge that things are a bit rough around the world and they're just seeing how things go? Uh, Callum, we have about 1,100 investors and, and you, know, you can't generalise because everyone will tell you uh, honestly what they think. Um, majority of our investors are, are retired uh, high net worth individuals and they invest with us to get their monthly distributions to allow them to carry on their life as I'd like to. Now, they, you know, they have enough money to retire, but they don't like to have to go to a bank to withdraw anything. So um, the best times for us as a fund manager are volatile times because you know, the, typically properties themselves don't vary in price as much. Listed REITs uh, are volatile because they're, they're, they're on the stock market. And as the other great Warren says, you know, the current share price has got nothing to do with the true value of the company. It's based on anxious buyers, anxious sellers. So uh, most of our investors are just happy to, to get the monthly distributions. Some uh, will get concerned, particularly you know, if they've got some shares that have gone down and they go to the, uh, the Bowles Club and speak to Uncle Bob and Uncle Bob tells them how the whole world's falling apart before he hops on his broken down bicycle and pedals home. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you, you get some concerns, but overall we don't get too much of that. Uh, and that's why when I started the business in, in yeah, purchased the first property January 2010, I decided to start paying monthly distributions. And I was the only uh, property trust at that time that paid monthly distributions because uh, as one of our large investors said, he would get 17 happy days a month. So, you know, I started having every fund that we had at that time, they were closed end uh, funds, paying on a different day. So they get up in the morning, they turn it on, here's a distribution from Sentinel. So it starts on a high. Where with listed funds and a lot of the unlisted back then, they'd only pay twice a year. Mm. So the fund might be going enormously well, but until you get that distribution, um, you know, you, you're just not sure. So it's, uh, we have different investors and, and, and most of them aren't, aren't concerned at all they, they may invest in the stock market for other reasons. They invest with us for monthly distributions. Well, teeing off the article where you were quoted in the AFR talking about industrial property and what you said about the REITs, the listed retail, I'm, I'm presuming the overvaluation you're referring to was primarily in the industrial sector. Is that fair to say? Uh, they were the most overvalued. Um, you know, some of the office stuff, uh, you know, it's just, it's just smokes and mirrors. You know, when, when you have uh, incentives for tenants, you know, anywhere between 30 and 83% is the highest one I know in, in Brisbane, um, you know, you're buying a property that's saying a 6% yield and the tenant's got 50% rental incentive. Well, the, the reality is you're boarded on a 3% yield. Um, I, I just, the, the offices in, in, the, in the cities and some cities are much worse than others. I just think it smokes and mirrors. Uh, retail, I, I think a lot of that is... Uh, is underpriced, but also with some of the REITs, if they're a, p- a pure uh, management play, you know, their PE was, was based upon continued uh, increase in profits through through increased management th- fees, which they come from uh, normally the revalu- revaluation of a property. So if a property goes up in value, the management fee goes up. If they, if they keep growing the funds under management through a- acquisitions, your management fees go up, your acquisition fees go up. Now, all of a sudden, when... If they're not buying and the properties aren't going up in value, uh, the view on, on those properties changes massively. Hence, you've seen plenty of them come off 40%. Mm. So when, when you compare the listed REITs to what you're doing, what are the for, – for people listening, what besides the – you've got your monthly distribution, um, is there a strategy – to what you're doing that they don't, or how do you differentiate yourself at Sentinel? And I know you've got a great track record of success, by the way. So, but you tell us how you how you do it. Uh, buy low, sell high. Okay, I've heard that one. <laughs> yeah, a like lot that. of them have a strategy. They have a strategy of buying high, selling low. Uh, they have big complex boards made up of super intelligent people who want to look at a lot of uh, research, and research is only historical evidence. Research doesn't look going forward. So, you know, it'll be like CPI or anything else you get, Callum. It's what has happened over the last, you know, six months, 12 months, years, 
And by the time they look at a particular sector and, and decide to get into it, uh, that sector is run, you know, as you see with industrial. You get some of the, um, and I don't want to mention partic- particular names, but if you look at Goodman's with Greg Goodman, he's been in the industrial for uh, since day one. Uh, you know, difficult time during the, the GFC. That was all sorted out, and it's just a fantastic fund, high quality properties. I, I'm not an investor, so I don't read their property reports, but I, annual reports. But I'd imagine he's sitting on an enormous amount of cash. So the case that you were you were cited for in the AFA, you mentioned that these industrial leases are very long. It can be ten to fifteen years, and they have fixed uh, uh, rent rises built into them. So maybe three percent, which in an inflationary environment, you've just you're going to get murdered on that. As it happens, I have a friend who owns an office in suburban Melbourne and he's due to renew the thing. So in the commercial property world, what is it? I don't know if you can generalise across the sectors, but what is a long and a short-term lease? Is it is short-term three years and less? Would it ever be that short or is five years standard? Um, oh, for sure. Is- I, I, I think anything under three years certainly is short-term. Yeah. yeah. Some, particularly you, know, you get into the smaller companies that, that grow quickly. They don't take long, long leases because they can double in size every twelve months for a, for a certain amount of time. So they, there's nothing wrong with the company. They just don't lock themselves into a long lease that they they, they then have to keep moving. Um, you know, ten years is, is probably not your typical lease. But if you're getting a purpose built, whether that's an industrial shed, you know, a, a retail facility, or um, you know, even an office, if if you're one of the major accounting firms, legal firms, where their fit outs and millions of dollars, and they'll pre-commit to you know to a major building that could be a billion dollar building. Uh, yeah, they will typically be ten year leases or, or more. They just don't like to move too often. So it really depends on, on on the particular tenant. Okay, and in terms of when you see this situation, and you have your and you the people that rent off you, is it then do you go CPI or would you do fixed or do you do some combination or how do you address the inflationary problems in the economy right now or the threat of that? If that's better Well, uh, Callum, I think everyone's always trying to beat the market. So if you're going at a fixed review, let's say 3%, you must be forming the view that CPI is going to be less than 2%. I think most landlords would love CPI plus one or, or at very worst CPI plus half a percent. So you know you're always in front of the market. Uh, I think when some of these... Uh, particularly in the industrial world over the last few years, have done uh, fixed reviews of 2 2.5%, and there's been a lot of those. Yeah, those major companies, they wanted to know what their rent was going to be in year, year 4, 10, 12, whatever it was, and that was great for them. Uh, and, and so the developers doing that and the investors buying them, they had a view that inflation was going to be zero or, or, or one, or, you know, one and a half. Uh, but now where they've, uh, where they've got caught out, is inflation? I think was it seven percent? Yeah, it might settle down to to three or, or you know, four or five. Who, who knows? We'll only be able to look back and see what was right. But I don't think anyone is expecting inflation to get back to to two percent in the foreseeable future. So you know, if, if you're satisfied to have a two percent rent increase annually, then I'd suggest that your view is is that inflation was going to be one percent or less. So there's a lot of people being caught out pretty bad. Uh, you know, I remember. Uh, in, in my early days in agency, so back in the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s, it, it was not uncommon to see rent reviews of 7 or 8% annually. Yeah, that's because that's where inflation was. So you, your reviews uh, are based on most landlords want to stay in front of inflation. So, Well, let's just pause now. We'll circle back to the current environment. Can you tell us? You are a self-made man, as I understand it. I, there's a story that you used to drive taxis. I don't know whether you own the cab licence or you were just the driver. How did you go from that to where you are today in the short version? <laughs> um, it, 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 pretty simple. Work hard. And I think it, it, it and uh, don't take no for an answer. Uh, ask questions. So, you know, if you're a, uh, you know, if you're a junior footballer, if you want to improve, you know, ask, well, up here in Queensland, we're rugby league and proud of it. Well, you'll know, be happy then. Up. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. We're, we're just the best in the world. Um so if you're a rugby league player, will you go and ask Wally Lewis or Jonathan Thurston and, and they'll help you out because you're um, no threat to them. You, you're never going to, even when they're playing, you know, yeah, don't go and ask the fellow beside you because 
you know, you're, you're up for selection every week against him. You know, speak to the best in the world. So whether that's in, in property, you know, whether you're a, a jockey, whether you're a footballer, whether you're a cricketer, don't be frightened to ask. You know, I found most people will help you. And if you ask the people at the top of the game, uh, they're normally the most helpful because they've started at the bottom and got there. And did you, did you start out as a private investor in commercial property or did you get absorbed into some sort of fund that, where you learnt the ropes and, and you're like, I can set up my own fund and do it uh, better? Or h- how was that actual specific career journey play out? Uh, well, I started in, in commercial real estate at LJ Hooker on the 21st of September uh, 1988 and uh, working in the commercial sales division in, in the Hooker House in Brisbane. And then I went from there, I got into you know, sales and retail sales, commercial industrial. So that's where I learned what, what, what investors want. I then started doing some uh, developments for myself. I then found that you really had to get bigger or get out. You can't say to agents, I want to do one or two developments a year. Either you're in it all the time to keep up with the information or you're not in it. I then went and worked for, uh, uh, did some advisory work for a property trust. And the great thing working for them, I could see all the things they're doing wrong. So that's probably where I learned my most. And I say it doesn't matter what it is. If you have a discussion with someone and you find out how mistakes were made, you, know, you should be able to benefit from that. There's always two ways to learn, the easy way, the hard way. You can learn from your own mistakes or from others' mistakes. So I was seeing what they were doing in the areas that, that, they, were, that they were getting wrong and then worked for a, a probably owned mid-tier development company in, in Brisbane where I did uh, quite well running their non-residential areas, so industrial, commercial, retail. I then decided in uh, late 2006 that, that I wanted to get out of, uh, out of the business, have a couple of years off. I thought this, this is all going to end in tears. So I targeted Christmas 2008 to be out. I finished up there on the 14th of December 2008 uh, and the market tanked, so which was great because I was sitting on, on a bit of money. Uh, I wanted to invest uh, that. And I realised that, that you, know, you have to spread your wealth and whether that's on the stock market or owning residential, whatever it is, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Things can happen. You know, I knew a fellow, <coughs> excuse me, I knew a fellow who owned a couple of fantastic buildings in Manhattan, you know, the best in the world. And nothing could go wrong until a couple of planes ran into them. So it doesn't matter how good you think something is, something can go wrong. So uh, Spread your money, and then so I got into into the, the syndication business. I thought I want to invest mine in a number of properties. I then spoke to a few people, and, and you know, the, the the property market, as all market, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, came off very very hard. And I just saw it as a fantastic opportunity to start a business buying property at the bottom of the market. I had seen years before I wanted, I had an idea of doing that, and I couldn't get the support. But this time I I, I did it, and it was. Uh, it was very hard, Cal, but it was, uh, you know, I, I always think that if you can start a business and be profitable in year one, then it's not a real business. It's too easy to get into. You know, the barrier of entries are too low. So uh, fortunately, I had a bit of money and through my investments in, in the properties I was buying, yeah, that's how I kept it going. And it was certainly difficult raising money uh, in a market when most people are losing it. And particularly when, when you're a new fund manager telling telling everyone else that they were doing it wrong. and. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. Actually, your story reminds me, I'm sure you know the name Sam Zell in America who was called the, the Grave Dancer and he, that's how he made his name. So that's yeah. you sort of did the same thing. But it's so yeah. interesting that you started in 1988 because, as I understand it, that was a peak in commercial property that led into the 1991 recession. So that would have been a tough beginning, I imagine. Like, did you guys get caught up in that as a business? Um, well, I suppose we had the double whammy, Callum, because I started at at um, LJ Hooker and, and uh, LJ Hooker was just uh, was taken over by George Herskew, um, which was a pretty pretty sad story. And, and uh, George Herskew went down in a in a screaming heap, went bankrupt, and uh, so not only was the property industry in a difficult times, but the but um, LJ Hooker itself had a difficult time. So, uh, but that's when you learn the most. I find that good operators make more money in a difficult market. People will pay you for your time. In a boom market, everyone's doing deals. Yeah, they don't pay for quality advice, whether you're a stockbroker or a financier or whatever it is. In difficult times, uh, I, I love them because you can, you can make more money and I'm, I'm loving the next 12 months. So I think it's going to be a great time. I just mentioned Sam Zell there called the Grave Dancer. I know or I've seen it, you alluded to that you were called the Property Whisperer or maybe you were still are. Where did that come from? What period? 
I think probably around the, the, the 2012, um, one of the fellows who was working for me, there was a, uh, uh, there was an article you know, on the Horse Whisperer. So he's, <laughs> just, he's just cut the article out, out of the paper and put it up on the wall mm. and wrote Property Whisperer. Uh, so uh, that, um, that name stuck. And I, I can assure you, Callum, I've been called many things much worse than that. Uh, so, yeah, uh, yeah. and we had the, you know, I suppose like the horse whisperer who bought rogue, who got rogue horses turned them into good horses, and we we bought a, a lot of properties which people th- thought weren't very good, and have made a lot of money out of them. So that's where it came from. Uh, you know, we were never buying about buying best of breed you know, as far as high quality uh, properties, because how do you make money on that? You know, we make money out of properties, and same as I think any corporate takeover. If you buy a company that's being run. The absolute best. Everything's spot on. How do you make money? You make money by by fixing problems. So um, that's where it, where it came from. I'm thinking of that background. Then that was the eurozone crisis. The China was going to collapse because of the ghost cities. I mean, the the sentiment at that time was terrible. Did you ever have any doubts at that period that it might all go belly up? I was having doubts that I wasn't buying enough property. So. Okay. Uh, and that was the only thing, and certainly looking back, that's the biggest mistake I made, not buying more. Did you, have a, did you actually have the money, though, to do it? Or was it like at some point you get tapped out, I assume, even if you wanted to buy more? No, I never had the money, but you, you don't let that stop you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that just, mean, that just means you've got, to, you've got to work harder. And, Callum, that brings me to the, you know, the property companies that lost the most in the GFC were the ones that were most cashed up. They didn't do their due diligence. You know, there's there's a particular gentleman in Brisbane that I know very well, and you know, one of the better known property developers, investors in Brisbane. Every deal he does, that deal must stand its own two feet. It won't be subsidised by another deal. So, if it doesn't work, you don't do it. Where the the, the, the companies that were cashed up, they might have you know whatever it is, five hundred million to spend by June thirty, and they'll go and spend it. And, and the acquisition boys, they get paid the bonus on how much money they spent, uh, not by the returns for the for the investors. So, uh, um, uh, you so by not having the money, you have to be able to prove to investors, you know, in difficult times, that they should put their hard earned net worth in with you. So, they sort of keep you honest. And, and people would would regularly tell me how bad banks are. And I think people, you know, m- almost any day, most people tell you how bad banks are. And people would tell us that they're overgeared. You've borrowed too much. So I said, well. You know, if that's the case, and given that all banks are mong- mongrels, why are they lending a 60% non-recourse? They must think it's a good deal. And if they think it's a good deal, they're prepared to put their own money in, non-recourse, and I've got private investors putting their own cash in. You know, it, it's not some nameless people who are managing billions of, of dollars in funds by someone else. Individuals and most of our investors, they don't have financial advisors. Yeah, they're self-made people who make the decision themselves with, with their families. So... Uh, no, never had the money. I'd have to find a deal and go and find the money. But but I think that's what, what made it so successful. I was just thinking, <clears throat> you mentioned just before that you're really excited for the next 12 months. That sort of, that would go against the narrative, you know, we're a recession, there's a war going on, you know, all the reasons. Tell us why you're excited. Well, all those things that you said, yeah, that's why. Uh, you know, it, it's, um, you know, when there's bad news, you run towards it. You don't, you don't run away from it. That's where the opportunities are. You know, whether it's the stock market or, or, or the property market or any type of investment, to make money, you've got to buy when most people want to sell. And, and, and it really isn't that hard. But if you have a big committee and you've got to satisfy all the learned people on the committee, <laughs> and I remember I was trying to get a, a fund going in about 2012, and uh, I won't name, name names, but I got down to one the you know, international group who said, we're keen, can you um, get some research done, uh, bring it back to us, we need to send it off to to the Asian head office in Tokyo and, and the worldwide head office in New York. I said, yeah, I'll be back with the research in two or three years. Well, you know, when the market's coming down, how do you give the research to show it's going to turn? You, you can say, you know, my view is it'll stop here, but you can't prove it. Uh, so those people who rely on that research are the same people who, who started buying industrial property uh, the last two years, um, and have kept buying it, you know, right up till st- some things are still settling. We go and look at a lot of the privates; uh, they've been selling the last two or three years because they knew that things were just overpriced. So uh, it's a great time. Uh, you get you get people who are just too too nervous; they won't do anything. 
others get pressured to sell. Um, and it's just a great time. There, there'll be so many opportunities. But, you know, we also look at uh, not only sectors, you know, whether it's retail, we look at the sectors that aren't popular and buying those, you know, in, in the, the homemaker centres. About six years ago, we're the fourth largest owner of homemaker centres in Australia. We started buying those in 2012 when the, when the bigger funds were getting out of them. Uh, we then started selling when they were getting into them. Uh, you know, it, it's the same with retail. You know, we, we bought uh, a property up in Darwin uh, on the 31st of March we settled, which was, you know, the largest single property transaction ever north of Brisbane. I, I, black, I, um, black. I listened to your podcast about this one and it was very intriguing. Um, are you worried, talking of shopping centres, are you worried about COVID coming back? Do you guys follow those metrics of the infections and that type of thing? Uh, I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> but, Callum, you know, life will go on. You know, it's um, – and, and one thing, you know, with the last you – know, I don't know how many lockdowns we had, um, but the region areas just don't get hit as bad. You know, you don't have the density of population. You know, COVID – and a lot of things spread through contact with people. We saw when we had the COVID lockdown, uh, you know, people didn't get influenza because they weren't out mixing. So, yes, you know, true. in the regional areas where you don't have the density of population and, and, and at one stage there was some scientific evidence, whether it was true or not, that, that the COVID virus doesn't survive very well in warm climate. It, 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 sorry, it survives much better in a colder climate. Uh, you know, we have over a billion dollars invested in Mackay North, so North Queensland and, and Northern Territory. And you just go, go through and, and they just did not have the issues with COVID that the southern areas had. So, um, yes, there's issues. I think we collected 98% of our rent, um, you know, through diversity of location, diversity of tenant. Um, so it's another opportunity. And once again, I, you know, COVID, uh, we only bought two properties at, at sort of at the bottom of, of COVID. Once again, we should have bought more, but we did buy, did buy some. So uh, problems will happen and it's just how, how do you manage the, the problems? You know, you can just... Pull the pillow over, pull the pillow over your head, and I'll turn this off. <laughs> this right. Right. Mine was going up. Click the switch on the side. Thanks, mate. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. So that's stuff. all right. So, just in terms of commercial of the different sectors, put put aside their current valuations. Is there one that you prefer in particular, office centres, or it just all depends on what you can get the the value proposition at the time, and the sector is kind of irrelevant. Depends what uh, you can work with. The, the sector's really irrelevant. We'll buy anything, anywhere, anytime at a price. Um, I have to say, I, I'm, I, I really don't like office in general, to say, because in the major cities, the incentives are just too high. Uh, regional locations, um, the incentives are nowhere near as much. You, you might get 5 or 10% up in Darwin for an incentive in an office and renewals zero because People just don't spec space. You don't have people building a 20,000-metre building without having tenants. When the major cities, they do. They get a 5,000 commitment from a tenant, and they'll go and build 10 or 20,000. Uh, so I don't like the CBD office uh, unless there's a particular turnaround uh, ability, but I'd rather stay out of it. Uh, industrial, that's been very good to us, but yeah, we were buying early, buying big pieces of land uh, with income when others didn't want it, and, and we've got one or two that we're buying now. But we certainly look for the locations that others don't love. Uh, you know, most of the big funds don't buy in the regional locations. Uh, you know, we are Sentinels now the largest owners of office in Darwin and also the largest owners of retail in the Northern Territory. So we dominate that market. Uh, and, and with the current uh, issues with all what you mentioned before, inflation, everything else, People tend to retreat to home. They retreat to there as they're comfortable with, which leaves uh, you know, northern Queensland that pretty much to us. We, we are by far the largest investor up there. And we'll keep buying in those sectors because we know it. Um, and it is, you know, people will tell you all the things that are wrong. So you really have to be on top of your game to tell them why they should invest. And we've just had 50 investors, investors up in Darwin uh, and they can now see why we're investing up there. Most people um, are too lazy to get off their bum Callum and really go and have a look at things. They want to sit in their office and, and read the research, so which is old. You know, we go up there and we speak to the retailers, we speak to the, you know, you speak to all the people, you speak to the government. So, you, you know, not only do you have real-time research, but you can see what's coming up in the next month, few months, 12 months, 
rather than waiting for it to, to happen. So, you know, uh, when I was in my um, uh, back in the old days, back in LJ Hooker, when they a lot of companies actually did training, I was at a training session and uh, the CEO back then was a fellow called Graham Cook, and we're all in this training room. And he said, now everyone stand up. So you stand up off your chair. He says, have a look under the chair. So you look under the chair. What do you find? You find a dollar coin. What does that prove? Oh, I don't know. Shows you've got to get off your ass to earn a buck. And it's true. Not many people want to actually get off their ass to earn a buck. We travel a lot. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're supposed to go to Alice Springs today, but two of the team have had COVID. Um, you know, go to Alice Springs, uh, Tennant Creek, Catherine, Darwin, because a lot of projects we're looking up there, you know, um, Charters Towers. You've got to be prepared to, to, to you've got to do what other people what other people won't do. If you do what everyone else does, you end up where everyone else is. If you want to end up in a better place, you've got to train hard. You know, you look at you know, Greg Norman in his heyday. You know, he might win the British Open and then that afternoon he's out practicing. You know, you've got to, you know, the good people hmm. in any area work hard for it. Just <clears throat> two points on retail. I read a while ago that there was a debate between the landlords. I'm thinking of the big shopping centers, uh, like Centre Group and vicinity here, about retails. Uh, sorry, online sales, where the, the retailers were like, "Well, they're our online sales, but you can collect it in store." And the landlords are coming back. will say they're going into our centre. We should get a slice of that. Are you aware of that debate? And do you have a view yeah. whether on which is whether the landlords have a, a, a legitimate claim to take some of those earnings and whether that's a, a thing that could boost the, the rents, for example, of, of those centres? Um, Callum, you know, a, a lot of the people that buy will have seen that product in store. Yeah, they'll go and have a look at it. They might even try it on. They'll go home and tell their husband, tell their wife, whatever, and say, listen, I was at, at so-and-so today and I really like this. Get online, have a look. Okay, darling, buy it. <laughs> well, they wouldn't have bought it if the store wasn't there. Yeah, you, know, you can walk up through the through the, the Queen Street Mall in Brisbane of a night and see things on display and then go home and buy it online. Well, why did you buy it? Because you saw it in the store. Yeah, you know, each per, each will have an argument, but uh, uh, you know, and the other thing that they do with the uh, uh, you know, the good retailers, when you pick it up in store, they'll say, oh, where are you going? Oh, I've got a wedding on the weekend. Well, listen, here's a nice pair of shoes and they upsell you. That's because they have a shop they can do that. Um, you know, I know landlord uh, tenants will say landlords always try to screw them for rent, but I can tell you as a landlord, tenants always want to screw screw landlords. <laughs> I, well, I, can tell you, I tell you, I've never had a tenant say, listen, I'm doing that well, can I pay more rent? <laughs> never, ever, ever. Uh, you know, that's why you've got to be careful. They have cash sales. They're slipping. I can tell you, Callum, it, it, it's, um, you know, <laughs> God, God, God would be a landlord, not a retailer. <laughs> He's too honest to be a retailer. Is, is it fair to say that that hasn't happened yet in the Australian retail space? That, that those things aren't factored into rents, the list of commercial properties. Uh, some places they are. Um, as you've already said, most of them try not to be. Yeah, you know, we've got one of the larger retailers at the moment in, in a centre, and they're wanting to do a, 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 a large pickup area and not pay turnover rent. Well, they're using our space. The reason they come there because we've got the car parks, uh, you know, really, and you don't think you should pay us for it. Yeah, you do all, pick up all your groceries, pick up $100 worth of groceries, come and use our car park and say, oh, no, that's online, so you shouldn't pay for it. <laughs> who, 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 who pays for the car park? Yeah, you know, yeah. Who pays for the air conditioning? Who pays for the security so they can come and pick it up? I don't mind being fair, uh, but it's all uh, – and, and I know over the years some of the larger landlords – had really made it quite difficult for, for some retailers, but more the smaller retailers who, who didn't have market power. And their view was, well, if one tenant goes broke, there's another tenant want to come in. So I think there certainly need to be some adjustment. And it always comes back to capacity to pay calendar. You know, I say quite often a tenant paying $1,000 a square metre can be more profitable than a tenant paying $100 a square metre. It comes back to your percentage of turnover. If you're turning over $20,000 a square metre, you can pay a whole lot more rent than someone who's turning over five hundred. So, uh, the the rate per square meter, or rate or, or the amount per month a year, really doesn't matter. It's a percentage of turnover. I'm just looking. I know I saw you talking about Northern Australia and your investment case for it. The the, the yields look quite large in any sense, but especially to me, 
to overseas investors. Do you think even the listed uh, stocks we were talking about earlier, most of them have a yield of about 6% roughly. Do you think more foreign money will, will come into Australia because of those high yields relative to the ones you can get overseas, like Japanese, whether it's American? Uh, well, you know all the, the main markets, Asia, et cetera. Uh, well, it, it, there has been a lot, Callum. Um, uh, yeah, there, there's a couple of very, very big Canadian pension funds. Yeah, you know, the, the 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 Mount, the, you know, the 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 Mounties, you know, the Mounted Police in in Canada, their fund, the Canadian Teachers Credit Union, the California Teachers Credit Union. Uh, they are multi-billion-dollar investors in Australia. Uh, you have a lot of very big Asian funds. You, you, you've got a lot of very big European funds. Uh, yeah, there's a, a, a very large Dutch superannuation fund that has partnered with some of the large, larger REITs uh, over recent years. A lot of the German funds, Dutch funds, they have to, when they're paying uh, monthly pensions, Callum, and if you, I, I don't know what it is today, but certainly up until a couple of weeks ago, you know, the, 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 the yield on, on government debt, European debt, uh, was negative. So when, you know, a lot of places that, le- you know, legislation is at least 30% of, of the total value of the superannuation fund must be in government bonds. Well, the, when they're getting below zero and they've got to pay pensions uh, every month, they've got to look anywhere in the world where they can get yield with security. You don't want to go and, you know, there'd be a lot of, a, you know, Dare I say, sub-Saharan African places where you might get a very high yield, but uh, that would still not be enough for you to. Uh, so yeah. th- there's already tens of billions of dollars of, of overseas investments in, in Australia, and that and that will keep growing. Just talking about the the banks where you alluded to earlier. My understanding is you're at the moment. I think you said you're paying about two percent for your debt, um, and I've seen some of the listed funds quote similar figures. It seems very low. Is, are the banks going to keep those rates that low or are you already seeing that pricing pressure come through? Oh, pricing pressure has already come through, Callum. You know, we're already uh, – most of ours are probably paying more than that now because we normally have, have um, a variable, 90-day bond. Some we've just changed. And I won't say what we've changed to to save a lot of money because I don't want to give any, anyone else a helping hand. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, no, but, but we've, we've expected for, for years that there's going to be interest rate rise. I just not, didn't know when it was or, or how bad it would be. So you were talking about your cost of debt, which you've just renegotiated, and your funds have quite a bit of cash. So you're expecting interest rate rises? Uh, yes, yeah. You know, you, you, have to, uh, you have to take a view. You know, I've been getting, people have been telling me for the last 10-plus uh, years I had to lock interest rates in, um, and luckily I didn't take any of their advice because interest rates just kept going down. You know, I knew, uh, you know, one of the larger funds bought a couple of things in Brisbane uh, four years ago. And on that particular February, they locked in five-year money at 4.45. Well, that stage, you borrowed at three. Then it got down to, you know, a bit over two. Uh, and they had a couple of assets. They, got, they could have got an enormous profit to sell, but their cost of breaking the loan would have taken all the profit. So, um you know, it's not only buying assets, right, but you, you've got to manage the debt and all those other things. So, um, you know, we're, we've always been budgeting for interest rates to go up, so it's no, uh, it's no surprise. Um, I, I don't expect them to go as high as some people will predict, and, you know, I'm happy to argue with someone, but I prefer not to have the argument because we'll just look back in, in, in a year or two's time and, and see, um, see what happens. But I, I think, um, you know, when we started this interview, you were talking about the war and, and with inflation, and everything else, people are getting very negative. You know, I saw it, whether it's Westpac or one of the major banks had their their uh, consumer confidence out, and it's the lowest it's been for for decades. Mm. Uh, well, if people are, are, are have got that negativity, they will just stop spending, and the market will slow without doing anything else. You know, and in the paper the other day, it's they're talking about the, the largest property crash or deepest property crash for forty years. You know, property is going to go up forty percent, and that. Well, yeah, that will just stop people. That that will scare them. I, I just don't think interest rates are going to go as high as, as a lot of people predicted. And I say, you know, that you know, when when oil years ago got up to one hundred and forty barrel, they're predicting it it'd go to two hundred, and and when it got down to ninety, they pre- predicted it'd go, you know, be ten. And um, yeah, you know, people can predict whatever they like. You know, I, I just personally don't think there'll be a lot more in- increases. I the market just can't take it. You know, more people buy property, and I'm talking residential housing, uh, more people buy property and other investments at the top of the market. Very few people uh, 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 have got the 
the will, the guts, uh, knowledge, whatever it is, to buy at the bottom. So they buy at the top and their, their debt is massive. So while I know they say 30% of homes in Australia uh, are owned outright, you know, another 30% have got at least 21 months you know, uh, advanced payments. Mm-hmm. It's uh, the other 20 or 30% where the real problem is, and that's um, – and that's and that'll be a real problem. And if you slow the economy down too much, you then get uh, higher unemployment, which creates another problem. So. Just when, to swing it back to the listed rates, the the analysts like to look at bond yields, and then they'll they gather net tangible assets of this and the prices. Generally, to those metrics, do you think they're valid ways of looking at this thing, or, or it's kind of just, for want of a better expression, just kind of market waffle and it's not really how you as a property investor approach an investment. You're looking at, you know, whether it's population growth or the building or the location or what's going on around it. Are people too focused on these subsidiary metrics, I guess, is what I'm saying? Well, um, Calum, I think it depends, you know, who you are and what, you know, if, and who your boss is. You know, if you're a fund that's got a couple hundred billion dollars worth of investments, and, and one thing that I suppose I should say, you know, if, if we're at $100 billion, there's no way we could be buying, you know, assets in, in Northern Australia because we just couldn't invest enough money. And that's one of the problems that, that you have. You know, if you've got hundreds of billions to invest, you have to go to the major markets, like all the others with that sort of money, which, which pushes the yields down. So when they're competing for, for assets that are a low yield, then, they're, then they are looking at those comparing them with bonds. You know, why would I buy the industrial property at four percent when you know three weeks ago I could get a, a ten-year US bond at four point two? So I can see that. You know, whenever, when, we're, whenever in the situation where we're saying, do we buy a US bond at four percent or or a property at four percent? Because we're never buy a four percent. And I think what, and a lot of that is short term. You know, if you speak to some of the older heads, you know, what one of the one of the best things for property is inflation. You know, when, when you have inflation of, let's say, 7%, well, what is inflation? It's inflation is prices going up. It's food, it's goods, it's clothes, it's shoes, which you all buy from shops. So, therefore, your turnover in the shopping centre is going up by the 6 or 7% inflation. So, therefore, your rent goes up. So, and then also, if you have a quality property, whether it's an industrial shed or, or a shopping centre, the cost construction you know, at the moment, yeah, they're, they're just through the roof. Like, yeah, price up 40, 50%. So the cost to to build and replace that asset is impossible. You cannot replace that asset for that amount of money and, and your rents are going up because of inflation. So inflation really is fantastic for property as long as, you know, it, it, as I've said to a lot of people, it, it's not the debt that, that destroys uh, property investments. It's your inability to repay the loan that causes a problem. You know, it doesn't matter what your debt is. If you have an interest cover, we've got some with an interest cover of up to nine times. Well, interest rates can triple. Or we're still fine. If you have a, if you're buying a property at three and a half percent, and don't forget some of these uh, industrial properties that sold three and a half percent, you then have acquisition costs. You have stamp duty of five or six percent plus everything else. So your three and a half percent acquisition is sort of three or three and a quarter. Well, you know, you're borrowing money at two, two and a half, and that becomes three. Even if you only got a a thirty percent LVR is not a very good place. Uh, not a very good place to be. So, uh, yeah. Is, well, just because I went over the listed stocks, do you think some of them get too big in terms of that problem where they're, they're so big that they just got to find something to park the money in? But at the same time, oh. some some of them can be too small. I notice there's a couple under a billion, and yet there's just not the liquidity in the stocks. And it's like, well, what can they really do at that size? Do you think there's like an ideal size for a kind of property fund? Oh, geez, that, that's that's a tough one. I I, I think. You know, if things get too big, it doesn't matter. You know, if you're a teacher and you've got a classroom of 100 kids, that's how can you, <laughs> you, know, how can you manage it? You know, you, yeah, it's just chaos. Uh, you know, some of our, our, our big companies that, that I suppose aren't, you know, they might have you know, billions of dollars worth of property, but then they've got construction and other things. Well, well, how does one person keep an eye on the whole lot? You can't. Neural are relied upon divisional heads. So each one of those divisional heads has got to be, you know, one hundred and ten percent to make sure that's right. Then reporting back to you, and it, it's um. So yes, yeah, certainly the, the yeah you know, the bigger it gets, um, the more challenges. Uh, you know, and, and it doesn't matter what sector it is. I, yeah, what you're saying with is it too small? 
or just your cost of compliance, whether you're a property trust or, or a mining company or whatever, you know, the cost of compliance being listed on the stock exchange, you need to be at a certain size to, to, to justify that. But then also you've got um, you know, your answerable, and, and, and I just think certainly for developers, property development, it, it, you shouldn't be listed because you know, people, uh, given the ASX is so transparent, I don't mind transparency, but if you're not having profit increases every six months, then you're getting discounted massively. Well, with, a, with property development, you can't guarantee that. You could have the absolutely best development in Sydney that is supposed to say settle this this year, you know, from March, April, May, and, and making tens of millions of dollars. Through some other delays or whatever it was, it didn't settle till July. All of a sudden, your profit's wiped out. You're an absolute bastard case. But next year, it's great. Well, but you, you missed this year. So it, it's... um. Yeah, you know, that's a problem you have with development. You get some of them, and I'll just use Mervac, you know, a, a very good company. They, while they have a lot of uh, income-producing property, they they also have a, a significant development area. So they have a, a bit of a balance. And I think if you can have that, that call it annuity income from your your property investors, property trust, and then you get your your, your boost from the um, uh, from the development, that's probably not a bad mix. But you know, then you've got to get someone running it. Who, who, who knows all of those areas, which then becomes another challenge. Um, I'm just trying to think here. There's two niche areas that I haven't, in, like, just I've observed them. I wondered if you've uh, invested in them yourself. There's uh, the land lease, which seems to be a, a growing trend of where people buy the house, but the the property owner, such as yourself in this example, would, would keep hold of the land. Um and self storage. Are you in either of those sectors, or do you see them as attractive if if an opportunity came along? Uh, everything has a price, Callum. You know the, the land lease thing. It, that's just an annuity income stream. So if you want an annuity income, then yeah, that's fine. But you know where's where's the big kicker? You know we're looking for uh, a a monthly distribution with the opportunity, you know, to get some extra profit through a redevelopment, a resetting of lease. Uh, some changes like that, uh, where the, the the land lease thing is, is really an annuity, and if you're at, at the pension stage, and that's what you want, that's fine. That's not the sort of fund we run. Uh, the the storage, uh, mini storage, uh, we're not in that sector, and and I can't see us getting in because let's say we missed it. It was an area that that I know, and, and you can't be experts on on everything. Um, but the people who have got in early or you know, it's been going for a long time and, and one of our investors in it and and, uh, and the profits he make are just uh, are just ridiculous you know people will store um two thousand dollars worth of radial furniture pay three thousand dollars a year in rent uh, <laughs> you know it's just uh it just doesn't make sense but um you know a lot of those are very very good businesses uh you know they're very big they're improving it um well, just so, those National Storage REIT, which is the, the flagship yep. one, came out with its earnings today, and they're actually up. Uh, they're up by 24% on last year. So, But again, yep. the, the, didn't, the share price didn't rise. So, yep. um, again, yeah, it would, I think that was probably overvalued at the top. I thought so anyway. Yeah. Um, um, a very good business. You know, they're, they're mark, you know, there's some of those areas that, that, that you need to be, where the dom, you certainly need to be big. If you're going to do a contract with someone, yeah, sometimes big companies will want an Australian-wide contract. Now, now whether that's a cleaning contract or security or, or storage, yeah, you know, if you're national storage and and, you know, and there's a couple of others, Abacus are, are, are very big uh, in that area. Um, they can do a national deal with you know with, with some of the large accounting firms for document storage or something like that. So, um, now good luck to them. They've got very very good businesses. Um, we're not in it. I, I don't regret it. You can't. You know we're. Uh, you know, I suppose we're 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 compared to them, we're very, very small. Um, we're nimble, you know, our average internal rate of return is much higher. Um, and you know, we're happy with the with the sectors that we're in. All right. Well, I don't want to hold you up all day. So just to, as a broad brush picture for anyone listening, you're sort of suggesting, okay, the news is negative. But in a sense, you're seeing the opportunity from that. So you don't see the same dynamic that you saw in 2007, I presume Bay when you started, when things were clearly overvalued, there was clearly too much debt and too much money thing kind of going on. So while there might be sectors that are overvalued, some undervalued niches that you can explore, overall you're fairly positive for the next, I presume, 
three, four, five years on commercial property? Um, I'm having trouble containing my excitement, Callum. <laughs> um, well, that- I particularly, you know, I, I'm really uh, very excited about North Australia. You know, it, it's, it's from pretty much from Gladstone in northern Queensland or central Queensland, not northern, might be northern if you're down south, but, you know, central Queensland. Uh, you know, what we're seeing up in those areas, you know, in the mineral province, whether, whether it's hydrogen, coal, rare earth minerals, uh, superphosphate, um, uh, uh, you know, cattle, sheep, um, you know, wheat, what oil, you know, canola oil, whatever it is, it, it is, you know, Asia is growing. Um, you know, Australia really is is a massive food bowl, uh, and, and we've just got to keep improving. And, and that's where I'm investing. You know, if, if you look at in the last uh, few years, you know, with the house price growth, a lot of that house price growth down south, it was driven by low interest rates and the money pumped into the economy by the government, not not through any other type of growth. Uh, we're in Queensland. We actually have real growth. You know, I think the last year was at 46,000 people move here. Uh, They're I all Victorian. You, <laughs> uh, that's probably why I can't understand them. <laughs> um, they keep kicking the balls up in the bloody air, so just grabbing it and running with it. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think uh, some of the opportunities will be in buying some of the listed stocks. I think where they just get uh, uh, discounted heavily, and I think a lot of them are going to come off a lot more. You know, when when some of them are selling at thirty percent NTA, I wouldn't be believing the NTA. Yeah, you know, when was that done? Yeah, you know, that was either done, uh, well, most likely December thirty one, mm-hmm. because June thirty would probably not out yet. So that's thirty percent what the NTA was at the thirty first December when things were overpriced. And you know, valuations are done by sales evidence. Now that there would be almost no. I'd say there's no sales evidence yet to reflect how the market has come off. You know, it takes some time for it to come off. So, so you know, some of the industrials that are massively overpriced, I know some of them where uh, the, the contracts were re- renegotiated by half percent and one particular uh, by three quarters of a percent. Now, we're going to see more of that. And then um, once prices start coming off, then people start drawing a, drawing a straight line again, saying they've come off, they'll keep coming off or, yeah, they get to the point when they bounce back, and and uh, that's when you've got to be looking at, at buying when they're, they're near the bottom. And yeah, you, know, you only know when you look back when the bottom was. Um, and it depends on inflation, how long this runs. You know, oil, oil has come off twenty percent. Um, you know, you, you've got real issues in Europe, and and that's what's creating a lot of opportunities in Northern Australia with what's happened with uh, Ukraine and Russia. Yeah, you know, the European countries, I think all of them would prefer to be buying zero gas off Russia, but that's not happening in, in the near future. So, uh, yeah, they while they need they have inflation and they need to put interest rates up, they have unemployment at 6%. You know, Australia and America have unemployment at, in the threes. Well, at that, it's, uh, Callum, anyone who wants a job can get a job. If they don't have a job now, they should cut the bloody stale because they don't want to work. Now, if they've got physical issues, that's complete, or, you know, or other healthy, that's completely separate. But if you want a job, uh, you can get a job doing doing anything. But in in the Europe where they've got unemployment of over 6%, um, they've got inflation. Uh, yeah, the last thing they really can do or, or, yeah, that they'd want to do is put interest rates up too high that, that you slow business down because unemployment is already an issue. So what comes out of that? You know, but I, there's in northern, northern Australia where they're, Developing more LNG for contracts to Europe, which will go on for decades and decades. It's the same with the rare earth minerals. You know, 90, 95% of rare earth minerals come out of China. Now, America and, and those type of countries, they need rare earth minerals. Well, where do they get it from? They're looking at it from Australia. You know, for, for the new you know, green energy, you know, hydrogen, well, we've got the gas, more gas than, than, than anyone else. Um, you know, nickel, copper, zinc, palladium, lithium. Australia has it all. You know, we have the ability to not only mine it, but to process it. You know, in addition to that, with what's happening in the in the South China Sea, you know, that's been going on for five thousand years. It's not something that happened over the last twelve months. You know, at, at the recent um, NATO summit, uh, where our Prime Minister Albanese was over there, and they were, you know, NATO was talking about how do they combat the Chinese influence through the Pacific? Well, by having a, a base in Australia, 
you know, that's what they'll have to do. You know, how else do they combat it? They just can't do combat it by, by you know, sending out emails every day and Twitter. <laughs> well, that they have to be here. So, so those. So when you look at the population, the whole Northern Territory, Kellam has two hundred seventy thousand people, only one hundred fifty thousand people in um, in Darwin. You've got three hundred thousand people in in Newcastle. So when you start putting tens of billions of dollars into that economy, what does it do to it? Head north, young man. That's where the real opportunities are, and and they will go on for decades. Like this is not a this is not a flash in the pan. Well, everything, everything that you said would stand true for Western Australia too. But I haven't heard you talk about Western Australia. Do you think that's uh, is that so, like you're just too busy with what you're doing to look over there? Shit, it's a long way away. It's slightly different. Well, not slightly different. It's very different. You know, we've had investments there. You know, we had an investment in Port Hedland. Um, uh, Port Hedland. Um, gee, I can't think of the other place, and uh, and and Perth. So we, we'd have a direct flight. I think there's a direct flight once or twice a week from Brisbane to uh, to Port Hedland. You'd fly there. You'd fly then back to Perth, then up the other, and back to Perth. It's just so far. <laughs> that's too bloody far, is it? Well, well, it, it really is, and that and that's and that's the problem. And, and what you say is exactly right. But if you go up the coast of from Brisbane. Um, and you have a look at where the opportunities are. We're buying in, in Rockhampton, Mackay, Townsville, Cairns, uh, out to Moorumbah, um, Emerald. Uh, you have a look at, at Western Australia. Like Western Australia is, is a massive, massive state. Mm. So if you have a look from north of Perth, you know, how many town, or how many cities have over 100,000? I don't think there's any. And that's a problem. If, you, if you're not investing in mining, what do you invest in? Well, if you invest in accommodation or other business that are based upon mining, where you, you get to, you know, here the Sunshine Coast, uh, Gladstone, say Rockhampton, Townsville, Mackay, all of those places, they have other industries that they have. They have rural. Now, I know they'll have rural in, in West Australia, but their cattle farms are a couple million acres run by 10 people. Yeah, you know, it's not the intensive cropping. I know Ward River, separate. You know, all up the, the coast, you know, Innisfail, Lingham, Tully, you know, sugar cane, you know, they're getting in, into aquaculture. Um, there's a, a you know, the, the population from Gladstone up to Cairns compared with, you know, if you draw a line straight across to WA, uh, there's not many people there. So WA, um, a lot of money. You can see their state budget is fantastic. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's a long way from town to town. Uh, we can go to Mackay here where we've got, a couple hundred million dollars investments, about 20 properties. Towns we got 12 or 15. Um, you know, we've got about 600 million invested in Darwin. Um, I just think there's a business called uh, Hotel Property Investments that owns a string of pubs throughout Queensland. It just occurred to me, do you guys own pubs? Have you ever looked at that sector? Uh, no and yes. Uh, we, we're actually unconditional on a hotel that we will settle in. Um, we're waiting for the license to be transferred. As soon as that's done, we will settle on that on that hotel. It was one that we bought in a in a, in a rural regional mining area. Uh, we bought more than a going concern because last year we bought the shopping centre. Doing the due diligence, we saw how much turnover the bottle shop was doing. We thought, geez, we should have a look at the pub. <laughs> uh, we bought the we bought the pub, so we're unconditional. We'll settle once we land. So uh, we have another one up there that, that um, yeah, but we we don't run businesses. So we've got to buy something that, 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 is, that is leased. We bought this and then we end up getting a, a tenant to take a 20-year lease. So it, it ticks all the boxes for us. And there's some extra development land, so it's very good. Hmm, interesting. Where, where the, a lot of the ones that were a 20-year lease or 15-year lease to Coles or Woolies, those yields were just too short for us, Callum. There was really no – there was no upside. Uh, well, if you bought them you know, five years ago and they're 6%, then you sell them at 4%, that was, that was the upside. Um, wasn't it wasn't a sector that we're in and um as i say you, you can't be in everything um you know we, we uh, the sectors our industrial our retail um and our regional located offices that, that's been very very good for us we, we own the ferry terminal and so if you go fairly beach to hamilton island that's our ferry terminal yeah we bought that at, at a, a very very good price it's a fantastic asset so we'll buy anything at a price we just need to understand it and see how we get out of it and I assume you're a reluctant seller, but do you, do you ever have a? Do you, I mean, perhaps frequently, do you have a situation where you're like, "Well, we really want to buy this over here, but 
it means we're going to have to sell this over here kind of thing? Or would you first go to the banks or whoever you get your money off and go try and do it through debt first? Or do you have that sort um, of dynamic? Well, we've sold a bit over a billion dollars worth of properties the last six years. So we do sell. Um, you know, if we're, if we like to buy things at what we think is below market. If someone wants to offer, offer, offer us more than we think it's worth, but we sold a property about two months ago. We paid $48 million for five years ago or six years ago and people – Everyone in Brisbane was saying behind our back we paid too much. We got eighty eight million for it. We got over twenty five percent internal rate of return over six years after paying monthly distribution of nine and a half percent. Now that that was industrial asset, the price we got paid was, was was full. I just couldn't see where the upside was there for the foreseeable future, so we sold that. Um, so so we've sold just a, a little bit over a billion. I think about one billion and and, and fifty million, something like that. Um, you know, and, and we bought. I said, you know, five, six years ago, we're the, we're the fourth largest owner of homemaker centres in Australia. We're buying those when they were 10, 12% or, and higher. Um, and then we sold them at the. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're not a reluctant seller. Um, just over recent years, we haven't been wanting to sell as much because most of our investors, you know, they didn't want us to sell. They'd say, well, you know, I sell it, yes, I make a good profit, and I put it in the bank, but I get 1%. You know, they, they're looking. So while you make good capital gain, yeah, you know, by the time they they uh, and they're getting nine and a half percent distribution off us, they put in the bank getting one percent or less, and for a lot of time you were getting less. A few years and it's all gone. So they didn't want us to sell um, because they have to. Well, what else do I do with my money? Is there something yeah. better? So um, we've sold quite a lot of property at the moment. We've got a, a couple of assets uh, that we're selling. It's probably about eighty hundred million dollars worth. We're selling. For a particular reason, uh, you know, if you have a closed end fund and they're an ASIC, they last for seven years. You can uh, extend them by two years at a time if you get seventy five percent of the unit holders vote to extend. So with those, if they're closed end funds, you, you you get to a stage where you've got to sell. The problem with closed end funds, while a lot of people want a definite time, um, uh, what happened? You know, the boom in, in, in unlisted property. You know, saying with, with property boom before was 2005, 2006, 2007. Um, you know, peak 2007 or 2000, no, peak 2007. So if you're a closed end fund, which most of them were, the unlisted ones, and you've got to sell it in seven years, so that's 2012, 2013, 2014 when you've got to sell in a down market. Mm. Now, if you've got to get refinanced, you've got to go to investors in down market. So, will you put more money in? Uh, not likely. So, um, that's one of the real problems. Because, oh, I want to know when I'm getting my money back. So, you're happy to sell in the down market? Oh, no, no. Oh, I want to sell in, a, you know, in an up market. So, we've got open ended funds where, where you don't have those requirements to sell in a certain amount of time. It's just a matter of, then of, of managing, managing them, um, yeah, to, to sort of buy and sell at the right time. We've got a couple of our funds are sitting on. A lot of cash, uh, and we're looking to redeploy that, uh, which we will in the next twelve months or so. So, just on a personal level, you're obviously very successful. I mean, is there a point where you go, "I've had enough of this," or is it just like you're just driven to constantly, uh, you know, follow the world? You want to be involved, and you you want to make money for people, and, and you do it for the love of what you're doing more so than, uh, you know, playing golf every day. Um, golf, what a waste of time. <laughs> You don't invest in golf courses there. <laughs> uh, it's, just, it's just too slow. What I want to do is I want to get into making podcasts and video interviews. I think that's an exciting area to get into. Um, I'm just joking, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I actually thought you were serious then. <laughs> no. Not that, no. Um, you know, I enjoy what I do. Uh, you know, I have a, a few hundred acres of farm, 38 kilometres from Brisbane CBD. You can see the, the city from the balcony. Um, yeah, that's... Uh, we get out there. I'll get out there tomorrow about about lunchtime. Uh, you know, I, I, we enjoy making money. Um, you enjoy know, spending get, it. <laughs> um, yeah, but but that but that is a is a skill. You know, you find people who who have, who have started from nothing have made it. That it's quite a lot. Of, a lot of us don't like to spend it too much. You know, where the people who haven't made it and have got their parents' money, they normally spend it too quick. So yeah, it, it, it's um. But I say to people, if if um. If you don't spend money on things you enjoy, then what's good at making it? You know, what, what did you make it for? So I, I try to try to balance that out. Yep. Um, so we have a pretty good life. I enjoy the property sector. Uh, you meet interesting people. I live in the city, 
say, a few hundred metres from where my office is, so I don't have the issues of, of stuck in the, in the morning or afternoon traffic. Um, you know, here in my office, I'm looking out over the Brisbane River. Um, you know, it, it's a pretty good life. I, I, I travel. Um, I've done 101 countries. Uh, before COVID, I'd do 25 to 30 countries every year, going to different conferences. We've just do you come invest back. overseas? No. I, I actually looked at investing in the States and looked at investing in Asia, and I actually set up a, a company in, in Asia some years ago uh, to buy a couple of REITs over there. But then I um, was thinking about it, and, you know, uh, over the 12 years, we've averaged 25% internal rate of return or 2456 and I thought, if you're not happy with 25% internal rate of return, you're probably too greedy. You know, what are you after? Um, and it's hard enough keeping eye on things here. You know, <laughs> I can imagine. Well, it, it, you know, it really is. In the different states. You know, I had a, a large international firm some years ago wanted me to take my model to, uh, to Europe. And we actually met in Las Vegas. I was over there for a shopping centre conference. And while it was quite flattering, I said, listen, it's just too far away. If something goes wrong, it takes me too long to get there. If it was something in Asia where you could be there in six or seven hours, uh, that's fine. Uh, you know, you need to keep an eye on things. And, and just for this, you know, I, our business, I try to get Mackay and Townsville and Darwin regularly to keep an eye on things. Um, you know, that there's always something wrong. And if you're just not there, no one cares about it as much as I do. Um, so I enjoy it. Like, what else do I do? Go and sit on the beach? Well, I don't like bloody sand. It gets you in the shoes. <laughs> you know, seriously, it, it's it's... I don't like that. Um, what, what do you do with, you know, I have quite a, a few people here in, in their 70s, you know, people I've known for 30 years, and they work as hard as they want, but they do this because they enjoy it. And, and you know, as corny as it may seem, I do enjoy making money for people. You know, all of our investors would have my mobile number. Now, while I don't want them calling every day, if they have a problem, they call me, you know. And, and uh, you know, when you've got, well over a billion dollars worth of, worth of funds under management, 1,100 investors, there's always something going wrong. But normally it's not as bad as what they think and there's always a way out of it. Um, and I'm happy to talk them down off the ledge. Um, yeah, I, I enjoy it. I, I, don't see, uh, I don't see getting out of it in the foreseeable future. There's too much fun to be had, too much money to be made, and it's never been easier making money, Callum. I'm uh, not in the podcast business. <laughs> <laughs> I read that you guys have an investor day or you used to have an investor day every couple of times a year. Is that just where you get together with the guys and, you, and the ladies and have a beer or a cup of tea or do you actually take them through what you're seeing in the world and the markets? Um, all of that. We, we've just finished our, our investor tours. We had one in, in Brisbane, Sydney, and we used to do one in Melbourne, but we only have about 40, 50 investors down there. You might only get 20 people to the day and it's just no way that justified. So this time we had one up in Darwin. We had about 50 investors come to Darwin. So we will run through all of the assets. Um, you know, we'll have a sit-down lunch, you know, a couple of courses, a, a, a few drinks. Um, we'll run through the, through the portfolio, what's what's happening, what's what's gone wrong, you know, what, what we're working on to expand. Uh, and then I'll get up and just run through the general economy, uh, how I see things, you know, nationally, internationally, the different sectors. Uh, areas that we want to be be uh, getting into, and I'll just open up for questions. Whatever people want to ask, I'm I'm happy to answer. Can I come to the next one? I'm not rich enough to invest, but is nah. that too much to ask? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, where, where are you, Callum? I'm in Melbourne, the the place that's been left behind. Uh, I mean, I'll pay it myself to go there. No, we'll come up, fly up to Sydney. All um, right, yeah. but how will I know that it's on? How will I uh, remind you? No, I, I think we've got I've got Adam Baker sitting here, the Professor Sherlock. So they're writing notes down. So they'll they'll send it to you. Normally get a, get a. I'll work in one in Melbourne this year. Oh, he's saying want to do one in Melbourne. Well, I've got to buy some shoes. Oh, I've got to buy some shoes. The McLeod shoes. We've got a lot more points there. McLeod yeah, shoes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, now I've been told I've got to go to Melbourne. We're doing Melbourne for sure. We're doing Melbourne for sure. There we go. Yeah. Oh, beauty! Yeah, yeah, come down here. We'll take you to the footy. Come on, it's not that yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Professor's already got tickets for the grand final, so he's right. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah, so um, uh, we'll get down there. Uh, yeah, I don't know, but apparently we've got a lot more investors uh, who came into um, uh, into Casarina Square. So, yeah, we're, um, you know, quite often we'll say to people, like, bring someone else along. Um, you know, in Brisbane, we, we capped it at about 110 uh, at, at the Brisbane Club. 
and, and you know, there might be one or two. Like someone might getting a bit old and wanting to retire and they want to bring their, you know, one of their children along who's going to take over and that, we have absolutely no problem, but we have a limit to it. Um, in Melbourne, you know, we normally go, to, I used to go to the RSCV um, in the city. Oh, yeah, I've been there in Collins. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so quite often, you know, people could, would, well, people come along, their husband, wife come along, whatever, you know, that's, that's not an issue. We've got nothing to hide. And, and um, normally people come along and, and they, want to, they want to invest. So uh, just try and take Gold Lotto in between now and then, Callum, and hopefully you win something. <laughs> in terms of is there anyone else that, anyone listening to this, that you, res- oh, I'm sure there's people you respect in the property world, but is there a particular commentator, analyst, investor, or is there just maybe perhaps too many or they're too obscure to single someone out? Um, I think there's a lot of people who have, have different strengths. Um, and and if, you, if you certainly have a look at, at David, uh, the CEO at Charter Hall, uh, what a fantastic job he has done over the last uh, decade. You know, Char- Charter Hall uh, had a pretty tough time in the early stages of the GFC. But uh, he got it recapitalised, and he's gone from I don't know a couple of billion up to up to fifty billion. So he's gone, uh, he's gone very hard. But uh, again, that could bring the challenges that you you discussed early. Uh, certainly, the Lowy family, Frank Lowy, uh, just an absolute genius. You know, I, I think um, but worked very hard. You speak people who work for them. You know, the whole Lowy family were very much involved, uh, hands on in, in all all areas. Uh, you know, Frank got out. At the top of the market, and at the top of the market, he got a premium. He sure did. I mean, and, remember that. Yeah. And, and once it, and it, they kept a ten percent stake in the property trust, and once they sell, now that's it. It's all over. Uh, yeah, for him to sell that, he knows it's only down down from here. Uh, and they were the best retail managers in the world. If you had a look at that, yeah, they were just market leaders. Um, yeah, you know, say Greg Goodman in, in the industrial. You know, I think he's absolute. He doesn't need to need me to tell him how good he is. Um, yeah, tough time the GFC, but you know when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Um, yeah, very focused on that industrial sector and best of breed everywhere in the world. Uh, yeah, and while his share price might get punished, um, he'd be very well capitalised. Quality assets. Uh, yeah, a massive development pipeline. Um, yeah, so so there's a number of them, but there's a. Uh, I never cease to be amazed at the billions of dollars that are torn up by some in, some uh, some companies that just buy at the wrong time and sell at the wrong time. It just never ceases to amaze me. Well, I think we can leave it there. So, of course, anyone listening to this, we can refer them on to the Sentinel website. Is that probably the best place to start if they want to find out more about you and the way you go about it? Absolutely. That, that's the best way, Cal. And if you have enough, if they want to do a, a televised Q&A or whatever, on you know, if that's something that you do, I, I'll, I'm happy enough to do that if, if that's uh, if that. Is something you're interested in as well? Oh, definitely. We can explore it. We've got a uh, an analyst that covers the property market, more focused on residential because that's what a lot of people are interested in. Yeah. Um, but absolutely, we're always looking at the property and property cycles and all that type of thing and uh, all the things that it's such an important. Well, it's the biggest asset of Australia and around the world. So, yeah, yeah sure. Thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. And Terrific. Hopefully, Thanks, Alan. I'll, I'll see you around. See you at the Melbourne uh, Investor. Conference. Daddy. Thank you. Cheers, Bye. Thank you.